Hello and welcome to our PS webinar series. Today's uh, webinar uh, will feature uh, information about the excuse me about the Solus condominiums. It'll be for one C CEU and also one AIA. You'll be given a self-report number at the end of the webinar for you to be able to self-report. You can do that by following the link that will be provided after the webinar or going to our website. You can take a look at the control panel on the side of your screen. Feel free to type any questions that you have into the question box on the right. We may be able to answer a few of those questions if time allows at the end of the webinar. Also keep an eye out on the chat box for information and links that we may send during the webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Aaron and Emily. Good morning, everyone, or perhaps good afternoon, depending where you're watching from. Thanks for joining us. I'll just get started here in one second. There we are. Let's get that out of the way. Okay. There we there go. There we are. Good morning. So my name is Aaron. Uh, I was the PM and project architect during the schematic design and design development phase of the project. Hey there. My name is Emily Doe. I was the architect and architectural project manager through the construction documents and then um, ongoing construction phase. And, and today we're going to walk you through sort of a case study and some of our lessons learned takeaways as a result of this project. Uh, this is Solus up on Capitol Hill in Seattle. So we presented originally presented this presentation at the Passive House Northwest Conference earlier this spring down in Portland. And we wrote this little top 10 tips uh, blog to go along with it as we were learning quite a bit about the process and Passive House development for multifamily. Um, so we've sprinkled some of this throughout and wanted to give a shout out to Kat and everybody over at FIAS for inviting us to present this webinar to you today and share our information. Oh yeah, and then there's a there's the address for the blog if you want to read more uh, when this is done. And I believe this will be shared uh, after after recording. So we're recording this. Uh, the format we're going to present for about 45 minutes, uh, and we'll introduce the project and provide some influencing factors and goals that drove the development of the project. Uh, then we'll review the passive house strategies and design details. And then we'll get into kind of the challenges and takeaways that resulted uh, during the process. And then we'll finish up with 10 to 15 minutes for question and answer. And our understanding is the questions, just type them into the chat box, and then we can read them from the chat box. We weren't able to initiate <clears throat> a, a phone. We won't be able to hear people ask questions. OK, so a little about the project. Um, it's located in Seattle. Uh, it is a 45-unit mixed-use project. There is one level of below grade parking for about 12 or 13 token parking stalls. Um, then there's the street level retail and commercial space, uh, and then five levels of residential units up above. And the unit mix is from studios to two bedroom units, um, and those are located at the corner. And then we also have a rooftop terrace up at the top. Um, and the project is pursuing FIAS Plus 2015 certification. So project timeline, uh, the design started in 2015. Uh, we did receive building permits in 2017, and then the project went on hold briefly. And there was a new ownership team that was brought in. So construction started in 2018 after the ownership change, and completion is scheduled for 2020. Uh, the photo on the right there is was taken three days ago, and that is the current status of the project. So you can see kind of the podium style construction with the concrete up to the roof of level one, and then the wood frame construction up above that. Uh, and they're currently framing level five with then level six up top of that, and then the roof. Um, you can also see the power lines, which we'll point out on a site plan, pretty massive. Uh, so the project team, uh, our owner is Solterra, and they are a pretty deep green developer. Uh, they've done a lot of projects in Portland, and I believe this is their first project in Seattle. No, no. <laughs> oh, they have many projects in Seattle, my yep. apologies. No worries. Uh, Weber Thompson is the architect and landscape and interior design firm for the project, and Cascade Built is our contractor, um, and they have deep green experience, particularly in Passive House, uh, with a number of single family and low rise uh, townhome developments that are certified Passive House. Also wanted to give a shout out to Arc Ecology, who is our energy modeler, 
and VEE who did the building envelope detailing for the project. Uh, so one of our first top 10 tips then was to onboard the right team early. Uh, we feel like we got a pretty good team engaged and having an owner where this was, they were passionate about uh, green design and sustainability um, really made a big difference as well as having a contractor that knows how to do this type of work. So the project goals. Um, early on, Sloan Ritchie, who was the, who's the owner of Cascade Built, he was one of the original partners of the ownership team. Uh, when the project went through entitlement and his primary goal was to really upscale passive house to the multifamily mid-rise project type um, so via certification was a pri high priority before we even came up with massing for the project um, in addition to that uh, to really kind of push this as a prototype for all multifamily development uh, the project is designed to be a market rate housing project so something that can be integrated into standard construction practice um, and it needs to be replicable. So we don't want this to be a one-off project like we've seen so many other deep green projects go. Uh, we want this to really, really use standard construction practices and be something that the industry as a whole can move toward creating. Um, one little side note here is that at the time the project went through entitlement, there were no height or area incentives for fees development. Um, and there was no extraordinary lending practices used um, as well. And I think now, since we're seeing more of this happen, Seattle has more incentives for passive house certification. Um, and I think the banks are starting to see opportunities for lending advantages to deep green projects as well. So that's our second top 10 tip was really to make passive house a goal early in the project um, and let it drive decisions. Uh, because if you don't, you're constantly fighting and battling, <laughs> trying to integrate those, those uh, design details. Okay, so context. Seattle is a very temperate climate. Um, the big takeaway, so this is from the FIAS climate data set, um, and then the map on the side kind of gives you an idea of where our project sits relative to the whole city layout. Um, but our big takeaway take is that we are a heating dominated region, um, and that was kind of where we started with the project. Uh, one of the other big influences being up on the Pike Pine in Capitol Hill was the community. Uh, we did have to go through a pretty rigorous design review process and in this neighborhood in particular you can see there is a lot of color a lot of art uh, a lot of active street and nightlife presence um, there's a very strong lgbtq community up here and music has long been a big a big part of the neighborhood as well so providing response and seeing the seeing this project as a good community member in that sense was also very important to our project goal. So as a result, um, one of the big components that we had was a big bare wall on the north side um, at our zero lot line, which is right where you want it. Um, but we saw that as a great opportunity to, to be an art palette uh, or a mural of some sort. So the project is looking to do something like the slide on the right, uh, which is another Solterra project down in Portland. Um, same artist, um, Emily, do you want to speak a little towards what's in the works right now with that? Oh, it's exciting. Um, we have not seen a prototype, but the concept right now is that there's going to be um, movement um, sensors at the sidewalk level to sense pedestrian activity and actually lights on the side of the building that will twinkle when people come by. So it's very dynamic. And it's the same artist, so it'll likely be uh, a woman of this nature, but with lights instead of plants. So stay tuned. So one of the other things kind of not Im impacting or related to the passive house design, but um, it is a market rate project. And so having a high level of finishes and a um, kind of a nice modern palette to attract not, not just people interested in energy, but also people that are interested in, you know, high tech trendy housing lifestyle being really close to downtown and Amazon's campus. Uh, there's a big market for some really, really nice high design places for people with lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> so we we were competing with other market rate developments. And uh, I guess the point is that we didn't sacrifice budgets on the interior spaces to pay for what was needed for the passive house upgrades. Um, the slide in the middle of the outdoor terrace space, too, also highlights the importance of the street level. Uh, for this project. Um, it really does need to be uh, an activated community space. So we have a very large retail presence 
Um, and then we also have the rooftop terrace on the right with another big amenity um, connecting the rooftop to the below grade landscaping as well. And while these are market rate, and the market rate in Seattle is just very expensive at the moment, but I would not say these are at the, none of these cost more than a million dollars. Oh, so sure, sure. In <laughs> Seattle, that means something, uh, sadly. They are small, 576 square feet, so. Yeah. Okay, so the site itself, uh, the site does occupy a northeast corner of an intersection. We have great exposure to the south and the west, for better or worse. Uh, we also have the power lines running down the west west side of the building um, and a zero lot line condition to both the north and the east, which helped inform our massing. Um, and then also you can see the proximity to the bullet center, um, which we took a lot of inspiration from and and we see that as a great neighbor that we'll have views to and really leading the charge of sustainability in Seattle and deep green development. Okay. So moving on to the massing, um, as an urban infill site and a market rate project, the massing is really driven by maximizing your FAR and what are the opportunities of the site constraints. So we mentioned the power lines, which required us to set back the building from the sidewalk edge on the west. Um, and then we also had that zero lot line on the east, which to have units running down that side, we had to set back from that side about 10 feet to get adequate glazing for those units. Um, in addition, we made a decision to pull the stair and the elevator core out of the interior of the building. Um, and that was our primary architectural move from a massing standpoint. And what that did was it, it helps us for pass pass, which we'll get into later, but it also creates a visual feature and a little bit less of a just a generic box. Um, and starts to create some visual interest from the street, which was important for the design standpoint um, from the community. Um, because we were set back up above, it allowed us to create the little jewel box down on the corner and really highlight that and activate that retail corner um, as an important contribution to the neighborhood as well. The massing is very purposefully box-like to set us up for success from a passive house detailing perspective. We did not want to deal with a lot of jogs or overhangs because um, that can be really tricky from an air barrier detailing perspective. So that leads us to our next top 10 tip, which was simplify the massing and the building geometry. Um, as you all know, the less envelope you have to address, the more efficient your, your pass pass assemblies can be. Okay, and Emily's gonna walk through kind of the basic pass pass strategies that we, that we selected for this project. Great, thanks Aaron. Um, so I think we're all aware of the basic tenets of Passive House, um, which entail one, an enhanced building enclosure, and that means continuous insulation and airtight construction. Uh, two, managing the solar heat gain to your advantage. Um, and then three, a balanced mechanical system. So of course, that's mechanically provided ventilation and exhaust, often with heat recovery. Heat recovery. And then the ventilation is tuned to the needs of the space. And that's very different than a code compliant baseline, which is over ventilating per code minimum um, and wasting energy. So I'm going to go through how we accomplished um, these basic tenants in our project and walk through some of the typical details. So one of the first things that we went about doing was setting the passive house boundary. And we very strategically uh, worked with CS to separate our commercial space and our residential space. And we decided to only certify the residential apartments. And the reason for this, there are a couple of good reasons for this. Um, one, as Aaron mentioned, the um, location of the building being in such a key, vibrant um, restaurant and arts district meant we really needed we really wanted for the success of a project, a, re a restaurant tenant in that corner space um, to be the icon and the identity of the building. Um, and then also there are very prescriptive zoning code requirements for grade level um, development in this area that mandate a certain level of transparency, a certain level of openness. Um, we, you really have to work with the neighborhood to get a look that they like. It would be very, very difficult to do passive house to meet those constraints and get passive house certification, especially given that a restaurant EUI is something like 300, um, you know, BTU per, per square foot. It's very, can, can be very high. Um, 
So we, uh, the other advantage, we, we ended up slicing the building at the transfer deck. Um, and you can see that everything above the transfer deck is our type five wood construction, and that's the passive house. And everything below the transfer deck is the type one concrete construction. And that really helped us out to um, not having to deal with passive house details that, that bridged both construction types, um, separating them, and just having one family of wood details um, really set us up for success. Um, there's one, of course, um, uh, challenge there on the on the very northwest corner. You can see we do have an exterior or an exit um, a exit stair from the residential that comes down to grade. So that's sort of the one exception. But otherwise, that is the passive house boundary. And here it is in plan, super simple, boxy building. Our one big move, like Aaron mentioned, is that we took the stair and the elevator out of the uh, thermal envelope. And there were a couple of good reasons for doing that. Um, first, it's less area that you have to condition, which pays off from an energy uh, use standpoint. Um, second, there are some real challenges with elevator use in passive house buildings um, from an air movement perspective. The elevator, just by the nature of moving up and down the shaft, moves a lot of air. And in a really tight building, that can be a challenge. And there are ways to deal with it, but we wanted to simplify, and so we brought it out of the envelope. Um, and then lastly, uh, in the city of Seattle, you don't have to count unconditioned space as part of your floor area. So it actually helped us develop more of the site which the owner was very excited about. And then, of course, it helped us create this feature stair that we hope is a real identity to the building, an opportunity for residents to get some fresh air and exercise, um, to use the stairs maybe instead of the elevator and maybe meet a neighbor or two. So it was created an identity for the project. So top 10 tips, number four and five, are strategically set the passive house boundary. And then number five is limit the vertical penetrations in the passive house envelopes, elevators, stairs, et cetera. So now I'll walk through some of our typical assemblies and details, starting here at the transfer podium. Um, what we typically see here um, at a concrete deck is we, we often just put that insulation um, at, at underneath the slab. Um, but in this particular instance, we put rigid insulation with um, reinforced gypcrete on top of the slab. So the unit partition walls go all the way down to structure. But this detail helped us tremendously um, with our perimeter details because we have some decks at level two for the units and an exposed slab edge, as you can see. And so by creating a thermal envelope that can be completely separate from the unit deck, you can see our orange line is our air barrier, and that all of our insulation is on the unit side of the air barrier, um, creating a continuous thermal envelope. And this is probably the most challenging thermal bridge we deal with mm -hmm. in our mid-rise podium style project, mm -hmm. is that concrete to wood transition. Yep, yep. And insulating slab edges, which we don't have to insulate our slab edge here. Um, for the passive house envelope. There is bat insulation below this to insulate the retail space below from the patio. Um, but the, the L2 patio is also dealing with our stormwater mitigation. And um, of course there's drainage and soil and all that can be separate from the passive house envelope. Um, and that's a good thing. So our typical wall assembly is we hope mind blowing. Um, we ended up with a two by a combination of two by six and two by eight stick framed wood studs with no exterior insulation. Um, the WRB is a Prosoco um, liquid applied, which is the air barrier. Um, we evaluated using a sheet good for the air barrier, and that was a totally viable option. Um, the contractor ended up deciding to go for Soco because. It helps with the means and methods. Um, the sequencing was simpler. They could do things kind of out of order and didn't have to, you know, always lap in a certain um, a certain order. So that was helpful. Um, but it's just such a huge lesson learned that in a temperate climate with such dense units, 
um, you can really get away with a very minimal um, envelope. And uh, our assumption going into this project was that we needed something that was more traditionally passive house looking, uh, a Larson truck with blown in insulation, um, certainly wood studs with exterior insulation. We looked at um, structurally insulated panels, all of these things. Um, and we're pretty, you know, through an iterative energy modeling process, we were able to whittle down the assembly to this. Um, I think that's just a huge lesson learned um, for multifamily construction. The roof is also pretty typical. We have a little bit more insulation on top than we typically see in Seattle, um, but it's just polyiso rigid insulation with a built up roof on top of our typical TJI. And then a very typical parapet condition with just one exception. Um, typically, the WRB would go up and around the parapet and here, the contractor is going to have to tie in the vertical WRB with the horizontal temp roof to create a thermal or to create the air barrier underneath the parapet. Um, but doing so will allow us to do what we need to do on the roof from a handrail in the parapet or landscaping. Um, all that can happen separately, lights in the parapet, that can happen above and outside of the passive house envelope um, and cascade built this completely comfortable doing this. It is no big deal for them. So that's top 10 tip number six. Use industry standard building assemblies whenever possible. So the second part of an enhanced building enclosure is reduced envelope penetration. And this was strategic. Um, most of the um, shafts and internal drains were brought to the outside of the building. Um, so that we didn't have to deal, so to limit the number of penetrations within the building. So you can see here on the east facade, you can see the um, exterior rain leaders are bringing the rainwater down from the roof down to the stormwater treatment planters. And then we have our exterior transformer room exhaust duct and our exterior garage ex exhaust duct. And then of course, what you do not see on this beautiful clean facade is unit venting. And a typical multifamily uh, projects have just an acne of vent hoods over this whole thing where you have the dryer vents, the exhaust fans, the, the bathroom fans, et cetera. And we're dealing with um, as much of that as we can on the inside of the building. So we have an inside, an interior central shaft, and our uh, HRVs are dealing with all the exhaust air. Um, we have uh, condensing dryers, so no dryer exhaust. Um, there's a research hood above our uh, induction ranges, and then a whole house fan placed pretty nearby the kitchen to deal with the uh, um, uh, environmental exhaust. And that's how we deal with exhaust. So there's top 10 tip number seven, to limit horizontal penetrations into the passive house envelope. So the next passive house strategy is to manage solar heat gain. And you can see here um, these sun studies at the sun, summer solstice and the sun studies at the winter solstice are south and west facade, get a lot of sun, especially late in the day. This is advantageous in the winter, but quite problematic in the summertime. Um, and unlike single family housing or maybe some projects on larger sites, there's not a lot we can do from a site mapping perspective to help with this. So our solution was twofold. One, having fixed balconies on the south facade and that also gives the upper level units some outdoor space and shades the glazing below the balcony. Um, but also putting exterior roller shades on the building. You can see here, on the right side shows the shades down. And then here's an enlarged view of the shade itself. The detail on the right shows the roller shade in its housing. And then there's a track that brings the roller shade down to the bottom of the window. And we've chosen to take the housing expression from the top and continue that all the way around the window, creating kind of a window frame 
effect. Um, the shades are on sensors, and so when the building is in a cooling mode and the elevation gets into the into the sun, the sensor will automatically close the shades. Um, but there's a user override button in the unit, um, so you can override it at any time if you are at home enjoying the sun when your shade closed. Um, so the windows actually have a somewhat higher solar heat gain coefficient than we often see in Seattle. And the reason for that is that we take great advantage of um, warming the units from the sun um, for the vast majority of the year and then let the shades uh, block it when the heat gain is not wanted. So top 10 tips, eight and nine, manage your solar heat gain. And number nine is leverage design features for multiple functions like the balconies that are balconies as well as sunshades. So the final passive house strategy is a balanced mechanical system. And this is pretty straightforward passive house, I think. We have a, a centralized um, heat recovery ventilator on each floor, and that provides the units with fresh filtered air and also um, deals with the exhaust. And then conditioning in the living spaces is provided by mini split heat pump. And then additionally, code was required, required us to put um, some conditioning in bedrooms. So we put a inexpensive electric resistance heater in the bedroom. Um, however, it is our belief that the envelope will control the temperature um, to a great degree, and we do not expect this to be used much. And there's our team. Moving on, now we're going to go through some of the design challenges and sort of lessons learned um, that have come up during construction or design and um, the moving target that continues to be this learning process. Okay, so the first one we've talked about the stair and the original decision to remove the stair and elevator <laughs> from the building envelope. And although great idea when it comes to Passive House, it proved to be a very big challenge when it came to building code. Um, this diagram is showing where we had the fire rated wall and and the, um, the separation between the interior and the exterior um, along that threshold between the elevator and the outdoor space. So that was what we proposed. Um, the building code didn't like it and I'll go to plan and show that in plan. So we had, we had combined all of our barriers. So um, as many of you might know, in multifamily buildings, you have to deal with fire ratings and egress, which adds a level of complexity that doesn't exist in too much, too much challenge in low rise and single family developments. Um, so our solution for this was originally we proposed combining all of the systems into the barrier, the single barrier. So we had our air barrier, our thermal envelope, and the two hour fire rated wall ran all the way around that that exterior envelope at that location. Um, when all was said and done and we had gotten to an agreement with the city and had a code alternate that they would approve, we had to relocate the two hour firewall um, because they were most concerned about separation of the stair and the elevator and not so much about elevator and the corridor <coughs> in the building. Um, so we were able to find a solution. Um, in plan, this is what it looked like. A little bit of a compromise. Um, from a design standpoint, we're now closing off what we were trying to keep open and encourage that connection to that balcony space, that deck. Um, but because it's an exit stair, we, we had to really treat it as an exit stair, which needs complete separation and no space for lingering and a lot of other features, um, which I think in the power of hindsight, you know, we would, we would reconsider how we might do that you know, in a more powerful way. Um, the good news, though, is that it separated our two-hour barrier from our thermal and air barrier. And one challenge that we had come across was trying to find a fire door that was all things. Two-hour rated, had a tight passive house air barrier quality to it, and a good thermal barrier as well, because most of these two-hour doors are metal. They tend to conduct heat and not perform very well for those other two purposes. So it helped us to split those out and be able to to have our passive house boundary um, be inboard. We were able to get glazing in there. Um, so hopefully this compromise works out to be less of a concern than it looks like on paper, and we end up with a pretty successful space. 
So that's our number 10, top 10 tip number 10 was to consider separating fire requirements from the passive house boundary. Um, and I think as we develop more of these projects, knock on wood in the future, uh, we'll find even better ways to split the systems or manage manage those requirements. Or maybe products will magically appear that meet all these requirements. So the one of the other lessons learned was that um, in multifamily construction, um, the subcontractor bids obviously drive the price of the project and they also drive the schedule. And um, using assemblies that subcontractors feel comfortable with um, means that you can be more cost effective and more competitive. So industry standard assemblies equal competitive bids. We actually designed this project originally with SIP panel wall, structurally insulated panels. And Cascade Built, the contractor, has had great success building SIP walls um, in other passive house projects throughout Seattle, even small multifamily projects. Um, but when we went out to bid, there was only one subcontractor who was um, comfortable who bid it. And they were not even local. They would they were going to relocate for this project. Um, and they were not cheap. So um, we actually reissued the construction documents with stick frame walls um, and got uh, more competitive bids in this area. I would add to the early on one of the one of the primary envelope considerations was to do a typical two by six wall with exterior um, insulation. And the big challenge with that, even though we do it on metal stud buildings and office projects throughout the city, it's pretty common. Uh, the big challenge for multifamily development is that you have to basically wrap the building twice, which is added labor costs. And in our current labor market, it was proving highly cost prohibitive. Um, and would we have had to do that, uh, we would have had to take funds from some of the other features that we were able to still provide on the project. It's so, because the steel framers also do the drywall and the sheathing and the insulating. They do it all, but the wood framers do not. So then you're dealing with different subs and it becomes a real sequencing challenge. So knowing your specific local market and your specific building type and, um, and you know, stretching the market, but knowing what they're comfortable with and what they're not comfortable with is key to setting yourself up for success. So this was a really big win for the project to, to reach this conclusion. Yeah. Okay, so another one, we have our lovely exterior shades, um, which not only were they incredibly functional for the performance in the passive house envelope, um, but they were also a great aesthetic contribution to really what's a pretty boxy looking building form. Um, the challenge that we ran into with this was that the product originally specified was an atrium shade, and they went out of business. And between, bid. They bid. And they bid on the project. And they went out of business between the time that we um, got their original bid and priced the project and started construction. Um, so going back out to the market, um, obviously prices increased for a multitude of reasons. Um, and we weren't getting good value out of the shades. Uh, we were also getting bids from contractors that did mostly single family development and we weren't very confident in their ability for working on scaffolding and working within the rigorous schedules of, you know, putting up a floor's worth of shades a day or whatever the contractor might ask them to do. Um, so we went back to our energy model and we explored what options were available to us. And the big option was we could actually remove the shades from the passive house requirements. Um, we were able to make the energy model still work. Um, the, the interesting thing was that by doing so, we put more pressure on the glass, which we were aware of. Uh, we did have to go to a high, lower solar heat gain coefficient. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> um, basically, because we didn't want to allow the sunlight to heat during the summer months. And what that did was that drove us into a heating dominated building again, where previously we were we were into a cooling dominated building, yeah. um, which is somewhat counterintuitive. Super. Yeah, that, this is just such a huge mind blowing exercise that the original model was a cooling dominated energy model in Seattle, which is a heating climate nine months of the year. But that shows how well the passive house envelope was working for us, that most of the year we're using very little energy to heat our buildings because the sun through the windows is doing a great job. We're spending our conditioning energy in the summer months 
to cool the building. So it's a cooling dominated model through lowering the solar heat gain coefficient and removing the shades, the archaecology could still get the energy model to pencil. Um, and it just meant that we were now a heating dominated model that with a super low solar heat gain coefficient, we didn't have to spend as much energy cooling in the summer months, but we're spending a lot more energy in the winter heating because we don't get to take advantage of that solar heat gain. So the good news is that there's a passive house solution to this challenge. <laughs> Uh, the challenging news is that because we're in a design review neighborhood, we have to go back to design review because this is on the exterior of the building and provided a great asset to the aesthetics of the project and work with them. But that's no different from a standard um, multifamily market rate project where if products need to be changed for budgeting purposes or whatnot, that's the process you have to go through. So, so we're working with the planner to see if the city will allow us to remove the shades. And it is a real shame because they do provide a really cool aesthetic to the project. And I think advertise that it's something different. Um, however, the reality of a market rate building is the market has to bear all incurred costs. And the new bids are just so much higher than the original that <clears throat> we are um, doing our best to make the project actually happen. So this is another really interesting challenge. Um, we wanted to use advanced framing instead of standard framing, specifically spacing the exterior studs at 24 inches on center instead of the standard 16. Um, structural in most walls was fine with us doing this. And Archaecology told us that this results in a 14% increase in the total wall effective R value which is huge um, to go from 16.6 .6 to 18.9 with no other change. And it's cheaper because there are fewer studs. Um, but it became a dead end because um, the cladding fasteners for the hardy panel that we're using, the 7 16th thick hardy, are required every 16 inches. And um, for a hot second, we looked at ladder blocking or different kinds of furring or getting an engineer to approve a different design. but all those roads sort of let it, we came full circle and we ended up with standard framing. But for the next Passive House project, there are very many framing options out there that can work with a 24 inch on center spacing. Um, in fact, a thicker hardy panel would have been just fine or many other options. So um, for next time, we'll know that um, this is an easy win from an energy perspective if we can choose our cladding early enough to work with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, condos. When um, when the project was purchased by Solterra, uh, they were considering turning this into a condo project. Um, Washington State, and in particular, and I know other states also have challenges with condo law, uh, they tend to favor the owners and give them more authority and power than, than us designers and and sellers often have. Um, so with that in mind, there is a lot of risk involved and we were very risk averse as the designers having seen and experienced um, the previous cycle of condos and the litigation that comes with some of that risk. Um, however, that being said, because of the intense focus on the building envelope, as well as the massive oversight during construction on a passive house project, um, our partners at Weber Thompson were a lot more comfortable with the concept of this going to condos. Um, the other aspect of condos uh, that everybody should be aware of is there's also acoustic requirements that, that tend to come into play. Um, so we would have had to put more money into that to upgrade uh, the interior walls as well as any extra details on the exterior uh, to limit that risk. Um, at the end of the day, though, the condo market was not was not as hot as they had forecasted, so we are sticking with the uh, rental apartments for this project. So starting to wrap up here, the um, the total cost premium for this project is currently around three to five percent over a quote unquote industry standard building. And this is primarily for the mechanical system, huge upgrade to provide air conditioning throughout the building and um, BRFs. Or, uh, sorry, not VRS, um, uh, HRVs. Uh, the exterior shades, 
our uh, higher and higher ticket item. Um, of course, passive house rated windows, triple pane with a with a with really great other technical values, and then additional labor for air barrier thermal details, oversight, and verification. But the benefits are numerous. Um, unparalleled thermal comfort, superb indoor air quality, and that is continuous fresh filtered air. The indoor materials meet the EPA Indoor Air Plus standard. That's, I didn't realize that until we started working on this project, that all passive house projects um, must meet the standard, um, and that high indoor air quality is linked with measurable health benefits. And I think more and more people really care about that um, and are aware of all the pollutants and toxins in our environment and want to live in a healthy home. The building will be resilient. The air conditioning will provide comfort in a warming climate. And the filtered air uh, provides clean air during times of the summer fires, which is the new reality for us here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, really terrible smoke in the summer months from the forest fires nearby. Uh, in addition, it creates a quiet interior. And of course, last but not least, ultra energy efficient. And we are targeting an EUI of 18, um, which of course is about a third of what an average multifamily uh, apartment building is using in the US these days. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the code that you need. Write it down now. And we will um, start to look at some questions and answer as many as we can. OK, so there are a few questions in the question queue. Um, mm -hmm. Can you see those? We yep. can. We are looking at them now. So first question can't tell. I think it's Matt Luter. Um, what is FAR? Great question. Sorry we oversight that. Um, FAR is the floor area ratio. So for zoning in Seattle and a lot of other urban jurisdictions, uh, there's, a, there's a calculation where they look at what is your site area and then give you a ratio of if your site area is, say, 1,000 square feet, you get an FAR of 2.5 or 4.5, and that means you can develop to 2,500 square feet or 3,500 square feet in whatever stack configuration you can make that all fit. Um, so that is pre predominantly what we work with in uh, areas with strict zoning codes is FAR as one of the major metrics that they hold us to. Um, let's see. All right, the next question is, can you explain the whole house fan ventilation in more detail? Um, sure. So the, um, the ventilation strategy is that there is one exhaust fan in the main living area, and then there's a second exhaust fan in each bathroom. Um, we've been calling the one in the living room the whole house fan. Um, I that's, don't know. If that's, that's a carryover from kind of standard construction practice where it's just exhaust air only, mm -hmm. and the supply comes from trickle vents through the window, which the new codes will no longer allow trickle vents, um, which is great because it shows that we're moving towards passive house design anyways. With they're actually, codes. they're still allowed. They're not required. And, and it's, I think it's a Washington state specific thing that you have these trickle vents in the windows that allow a specific amount of fresh air to come in, but it's not an energy efficient strategy. Um, so I'm not, Sure, we answered that question, but so the that's whole, the ventilation strategy. Yeah, the whole house fan is basically the supply area for the primary living unit. No, it's the exhaust, exhaust fan of the I primary apologize. living. Yeah. Uh, next question. Do the window shades allow any light through? Sure. They're 92% open. So um, you can actually see through them just fine. Um, we have a sample down at my desk, and when you hold it up, it's like looking through sunglasses. There's enough holes in the shade that you can see through it, um, and you get a little bit of a dappled light um, coming through. But it's designed to be a heat-blocking fabric, um, and it, it does block most of the light. But the thought is that in the late afternoon when the bulk of the solar heat gain, unwanted solar heat gain is happening, um, most people are at work anyway. So um, having an automatic shade close while they're gone um, 
shouldn't be a problem. And if it is, they can override it and get all the daylight they want. On a related note, we did look at it for privacy as well. Um, we are implementing tilt turn windows. Um, because we had the exterior shades, um, it meant that you couldn't have a window that opened outward without impacting those shades. So with the tilt turn window opening to the interior, we couldn't have interior shades. Um, so we did look at this as also a privacy shade. It does allow light through in the evening, but we we went with a level that we were comfortable with would provide enough privacy for the tenants. Well, the next question from Anna Perron is, was Woofy passive used on this project? And yes, Woofy was the energy modeling software used. And unfortunately, neither of us are mechanical engineers, so we can't speak too highly to the model. Um, Archaecology was involved with that, um, but they were great to work with, and I'm sure they'd be happy to share any information. How do you deal with the thermal bridging of the balconies? Ah, so we don't have a special detail. We have a standard detail. It's a steel knife plate condition, i.e. a giant thermal bridge with bolts that connect back to blocking and go through the wall. And the way we dealt with it is there are not that many of them. I think we have two stacks of balconies for a total of 10. Um, the bolts are the only thing that go completely through the thermal envelope. And Archaecology did a therm analysis to identify the thermal, the energy lost, and we included it in our model and made up for it elsewhere. Oops. Let's see, long question, bear with us. You mentioned in the beginning of the presentation that code compliant HVAC systems over ventilate the building. Does that mean the pH ventilation approach would need special permits? is not code compliant, or could you explain the major difference? Oh, okay. you wanna take this? Sure, so typically by code, you have to develop to an ASHRAE standard, and the ASHRAE standard pre prescribes volumes of air that you need to move, assuming that the building has a leakage rate and other kind of, I'll call it thermal bridging factors, but it's really kind of mechanical energy bridging factors. Um, so when you design a passive house building, you have a super tight envelope. Um, you're really looking for equipment that is more efficient. So trying to get smaller motors, um, trying to have a more continuous airflow rather than turning off and on all the time, which is what a typical system does because of the leakage rates. Um, and that's, that's kind of what the current code is designed for because they're looking towards the ASHRAE standard. Um, Can I type in? Yeah, please. It's actually a very simple code mechanical code, ASHRAE, is provides minimums only. So as long as you provide the minimum ventilation or the minimum exhaust, rather, you're code compliant. Um, and what typically that means is, you know, the mechanical engineer does an analysis for the space and says, okay, here's a unit. We need 30, um, what are the units of a fan? Um, CFM per minute. Um, well, I want to be simple. We're going to buy one fan for every unit. The biggest unit has needs 90 CFM per minute. We're going to buy this 100 CFM per minute fan, and we're going to put it in every single unit. And that is what we do on the vast majority of our projects, and it provides people with enough fresh air. Unfortunately, it also means it's very energy inefficient because that's conditioned air that is being directly vented outside. Um, so what the ERV or HRV allows us to do is to tune each space to the actual ventila ventilation needs of the space. If the need is 30, well, then we're going to tune it to 30. And of course, we have a boost. So if you're cooking something smelly or taking a shower, there is a boost function that you can boost it for a temporary amount of time as needed. Um, but the, the base rate is set at what you need and not at a minimum. Okay, next question. Any thoughts on the number of refrigerant lines going through the envelope? Did you consider VRF to reduce envelope penetrations? Well, all the refrigerant lines come in through a central point in the center of the roof, and then they come down um, to each of the units. Um, so I think the answer is yes. We did explore early on, we looked at having a single unit, or a, sorry, a mini split per unit. 
um, which was not cost effective. That is what we do. That's what we oh, have. that is what it is. That's okay. what we have. We did look at VRF and it was cost prohibitive. And I'm not exactly sure why, because we have other projects in this office that did the same analysis and ended up with VRF. Um, and I hear you on the amount of refrigerant lines um, and reducing the amount of refrigerant, given that it has very high global warming potential, uh, you know, if it leaks. Um, but I think this might be where having a contractor that's familiar with Passive House is really helping us because they're able to weigh what's the value of this system and can we manage all of those penetrations if there are, if there are challenges with those. Or it sounds like that's probably a fairly simple penetration for them to deal with, and they're more comfortable doing that than than some of the other mechanical systems that we looked at because we did explore a number of different mechanical options. Yeah, I think either mini slit or VRF would have been fine solutions, and for some reason that is beyond my understanding, probably related to cost, the mini slits won out in the long run. Okay, last question. Do you share the winter heat gain? Oh, no, we have more. Do you share the winter heat gain at the southwest units with the units on the northeast? Oh, man, I wish we did. We do not. I'm not sure how you would do that. That would be a challenge. Well, okay, so all the units on a floor are using the same um, HRV, and that is providing heat recovery for all exhaust air. So, in a way, actually we are, because all of the exhaust air from all units on a floor are going through the central ERV on the floor, and the ERV is doing heat recovery and then providing fresh air back to all those units. So, Indirectly. Indirectly, <laughs> the answer is yes. Great question. And should we okay. take one last question and then? Yeah, oh. We've got time for more. Well, we just have one more. If each floor has a central HRV, how is the per unit boost ventilation function operated independent of the other units? Ha <laughs> ha, great question. And unfortunately, the boost function actually boosts the HRV for the entire floor. Is that energy inefficient? Mm, yes. But um, it's just, it was cost prohibitive to do an ERV or HRV per unit. Um, so we had to gang them together in some fashion. It was better than having a central one at the roof, which was another really possible solution. Um, but we are, so that we can sleep at night, we're telling ourselves that most people will want the boost at um, sort of roughly the same time of day. I think there'll be a rush in the morning when everyone's taking showers, and then probably a rush in the evening when everybody's cooking dinner. Um, and then it'll be sort of at the non-boost base level fan speed for the rest of the day. Yeah, so I think this is one of the limitations of the equipment presently and the technology is that it hasn't really adapted completely to the multifamily scenario. Um, so if anybody's deep into manufacturing or the technology behind these systems. Um, we do need improved improved systems to address these mechanical conditions in a multifamily housing project. Absolutely. The sizing is huge and getting the right capacity. Um, you know, the, ER, the HRVs work best at a certain capacity and are more efficient at that capacity. And so sizing them appropriately is a real uh, a real puzzle that has to be addressed on every project. Uh, next question, um, could you repeat the insulation and the main exterior cladding material that was used? Um, pretty simple. So most of our multifamily mixed use projects in the urban infill projects, their hardy panel is the most common, it's the most cost effective, provides uh, an acceptable level of durability for our owners. So we are really challenged to get other materials on our buildings. Uh, we tried proposing um, some higher end uh, fiber cement products. Um, we've done metal panel to some success on other projects, but it tends to be a uh, hardy, hardy board that's painted, uh, tends to be the most predominant um, cladding. Um, Emily showed the slide of the typical assembly that we use. It is basically just two by six framing, no outboard insulation. Um, high, density high density fiberglass bat insulation and, and hardy panel on the outside, that's it. Yeah, um, should we do one last question? We're out of time. Um, oh, no, we're not. Nope. We have four minutes. Yep. All right, 
More questions. How do you deal with penetrating rated assemblies, i.e. corridor walls and ceilings, with supply and return ducts to the shared HRVs? Uh, fire dampers, I think? Yep. Uh, yes, fire dampers. That's it. That's just typical. Yep, exactly. And that's the last question. That's the last question. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and make sure to write down the verification code. And um, we look forward to joining you ne next month for another uh, webinar. And I believe I believe this will be posted um, after the fact. So if you have friends that weren't able to watch it, I think they'll be able to stream it at some point after the fact. Yes, it will be okay. posted okay. later on. Uh, what will happen is everyone who has signed up for it, you'll get a code. Uh, shortly after the webinar ends, that will give you a link so that you can view it. It will also be put on the member side of our webinar archive on our website on FIAS.org. So you'll be able to access that if you are a FIAS member. And then it will also be made available at a later date on our YouTube channel. Uh, remember to get the code and to go to our website or to follow the link that's provided to you in the email so that you can get your CEU and AIA uh, points. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and forward those to us. And thank you for joining us today. Great. Thanks, Russ. Signing off. Okay.